Hi, everybody. Okay, so in this screencast, we're going to be reviewing some reading strategies to help you with the SAT and with taking the SAT. Um, I'm just going to go over the basics idea behind or the basic idea behind the reading passage, and we're going to talk about some of the things that I've found as I'm taking the passage or as I'm taking <laughs> taking the SAT, and you should expect when you're taking the SAT reading passage. Okay. So we're going to look at the reading strategies that I want you to think about. Okay, SAT reading strategies. Okay. So what you should know about the reading section is that um, you are given obviously the passages. When you take it online, you're going to see that the reading questions, um, the passages will be in the left hand side and you'll be able to scroll through the passages. And then when you take it online, the questions are on the right hand side. And you'll be able to scroll through the questions ahead of time if you want to too. Um, you are unable to pause, so it's not like you can look at the questions and then, you know, like that sort of thing, but at least you don't have to turn the page. So you can kind of scroll both sides independently of each other. That means that you can also answer some questions in advance. Um, reminder for the reading passages, there are five passages and you will see that there is one passage that is a prose passage, U.S. and world literature, so it'll be fiction. Um, there will be two passages that will be social studies passages based on historical events and things like that. And then there are two science passages that you'll see. Remember that there is there will be a paired passage. Usually that's in the history social science, but it could be a science um, passage. Some passages will have graphs and charts and you'll have to be able to interpret those graphs and charts in addition with the passages. So these are the areas right here that you will have to pay attention to on the SAT reading. First of all, vocabulary and context. Remember we talked about how that vocabulary is um, like the word could mean all of the choices that are given to you. You have to figure out how it fits into the passage. Command of evidence, that's when you're asked the question about like, where did you get that information from? Constructing logical arguments, that's gonna help you like step-by-step step remember cause and effect and problem solution, and you'll have to pick those out. And then scientific reasoning, that's what makes up your science score on the SAT. Okay, next. So these are those evidence supporting questions, and these are the ones that you guys were, a, a lot of you were groaning about. Um, because we talked about how you could get one wrong or two wrong based on how you answer the question. So this is an example of those um, prosecutions through sense. What is most likely the reason Jordan draws a distinction between the two types of parties? And then the next, very next question is asking you for the best evidence for the answer for the previous question. Um, one thing that I found, I've taken like four or five different SAT reading passages that have these in them. And I keep finding like a, a little bit of a pattern that might help you. I've noticed that a lot of times the correct choices in the best evidence question will be the longest options that they give you. Um, whereas, you know, like if you're choosing between uh, two lines or four lines and you're not sure which one it is, um, I would say probably four out of five times it's going to be the longer option. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're stuck and you're not sure which one offers the best evidence. But these are time consuming questions. Remember I told you where you have to go through each line, find it in the passage and figure out if it matches the answer that you did over here. Okay. Reminder for the data reasoning, remember that these are true false. So when you get to a chart like this one, the most congested cities in 2011, yearly hours of delay per automatic commuter, 
They have all these different cities here. And then they have the very large city average right smack dab in the middle. Mm-hmm. It says, which claim about traffic congestion, congestion is supported by the graph? So you have to read each choice and determine whether it is true or false. Only one will be true. New York City commuters spend less time annually delayed by traffic ch- congestion than the average for very large cities. So we find New York and we see that they spend 60 hours in uh, a year in traffic delay, whereas the very large city is less than 60. So this one is wrong. Los Angeles commuters are delayed more hours annually by traffic congestion that are commu- than our commuters in Washington, D.C. So we see Los Angeles here, but no, Washington, D.C. spends the most time. So that one is incorrect. Commuters in Washington, D.C. face greater delays annually due to traffic congestion than do commuters in New York City. That is true. So there we can stop because we found the one that is true. More hours here, fewer hours in New York City based compared to Washington, D.C. Again, you got to go through step by step and kind of determine is that true or false. Okay. Then you're going to find questions where it is a sentence completion. So it says... Um, according to the passage, the best way to, um, to fix traffic congestion is, and then you get the completion questions. I suggest that you try to answer it in your head again before looking at the answer choices, because you want to get closest to whatever it is that you feel is completes the best, the sentence, the best way. Okay, so a couple tips for you. Time is an issue or can be an issue. People find themselves running, rushing to answer every question, and you should try to answer every question. You don't want to leave questions blank because uh, data shows that you can, if you answer all B straight down, you're likely to get, like in the last 10 questions, you're likely to get like three of those questions correct, as opposed to skipping them completely and getting all of them wrong. Um, skimming the passage might work for you. If you're a fast reader, you can read every passage, every word of every passage, um, then just keep doing that. But if you are a slow reader, skim the passage. I'm going to give you a way that you can do that. So these are the most important points that you can focus on when you're reading a passage. The very beginning, in fact, the very first couple sentences is usually an introduction to what the passage is going to be about. Usually in nonfiction, at the end of the first paragraph, you get the thesis or the main idea of the passage, or in the science passages, you sometimes get the question that the passage will attempt to answer. Then you can kind of read very carefully the topic sentences or the main ideas of the paragraphs and look for transition words, words that change the direction of the passage. So if it says conversely, or on the other hand, or in um, a scientific study that showed a different conclusion, things like that, those you want to pay attention to as well. In the conclusion paragraph, the first sentence and the last sentence are super important that you want to pay attention to. Even if you're not skimming, keeping in mind this pattern, first and last of the first paragraph, first and last of the last paragraph, topic sentences and transitions, that's a kind of a good way to take a look at it. Okay. So to keep you keep track of what's going on, remember what I told you in class is to stop after each paragraph and think about what you've just read. Keep track of what you've read by writing down a couple sentence or a couple sentences, a couple words or phrases that will remind you of what that paragraph was about. Now, if you're taking it online, you have some scratch paper next to you, you can do that next to you and you can just do one, two, three, four all the way down and then flip to a new piece of paper to do that. It's gonna be a little bit more challenging because you won't have be able to annotate online, but you can still kind of keep track of what it is about. Okay, remember those annotations as you go through, reading with a pencil in hand, kind of keeping track of what kind of examples, counterexamples, things that you find within the passage. Okay, a nonfiction reading passage, especially one that is difficult for you to read, here is what I'm suggesting you do in reading it, Um, especially if you've been having trouble with, like, let's say the science passage. So these are nonfiction. These would be the history 
or the social science passages, not the prose passage. You can't use the same strategy. So the first thing you want to do, which what we did in class, is you want to make sure you're reading that information at the very beginning that tells you where it's from, because a lot of times it gives you the overall idea for the passage. Then you also want to pay attention to the title and author and figure out like clues to what the topic of the passage is going to be about. It's kind of like priming your brain to read that passage. Then you want to closely read the first paragraph for the author's thesis. Remember, the first sentence of the first paragraph will give you a little prelude to what the topic is. The last sentence will give you the author's thesis, typically, or the last two sentences. So read that first. Then ask yourself, what does the author want us to know, think, or believe? Because a lot of times these are persuasive passages, just like things we've been reading all year in um, AP Lang and Comp. Now, here's the thing that kind of varies from what other people will tell you to read. Next thing I want you to do is go to the last paragraph of the passage. Read the information at the beginning, read the introduction, and then jump to the last paragraph because the last paragraph will usually come back to like the thesis or the main idea or the findings. Before you read the rest of the paragraph, read the last paragraph, and that might help you understand the author's main point or the conclusion that the study has drawn. Then go through and you really want to pay attention to the topic sentences in each of the paragraphs throughout the whole thing. And sometimes it's a really good idea to mark keywords within the passage, but skim looking for important information. But look at those the topic sentences in each of those. If you have to go back when you're answering the questions to read a full paragraph of those, of course, go back and do that. But I want you to try this method. First paragraph, last paragraph, topic sentences play cl pay close attention to, and then skim read the rest. Sometimes it helps to underline the topic sentences to kind of help you understand it a little bit more. Okay, fiction is a little bit different. So fiction, you're looking at, first of all, it's usually part of a larger work. So you're not going to find the full narrative arc, like introduction, um, inciting incident, complication, complication, rising action, climax, resolution, because you might not find a full resolution, but you will find at least some of the same things that you'll find when you're reading fiction. So first, read the first column or the first part of the passage to identify the setting, the characters, and the problem. If there are characters, you want to think about their relationship to each other, and you want to think about how they react and respond to each other. And then you want to find out, you know, like what's the main problem that's being introduced here. The second column um, should be more of attempted solutions to whatever the problem that's introduced in the first column, or um, more character analysis from the first column. So read the second column and you expect to be finding attempted solutions or character resolutions or things like that. But don't expect a full solution because you're going to find that um, it's not a full passage. Okay. Some other things for you to look out for. You want to avoid words that have extremes. So words like never or always in the answer choices, those answers are never the right choice. You can almost always rule them out as possible answers. So extremes are words like absolutely, never, always, all of the time, definitely, undoubtedly, without a doubt, indubitably, which basically means the same as undoubtedly and without a doubt, you want to look for those questions, choices, and say, this isn't going to work because that's an extreme. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, science always conflicts with religion. Advanced technology is the only route to good scientific theories. Neither of those are correct. Both of those offer extremes and therefore Something can't always be right. Something can't be the only route. So you can immediately cross those off, and then you have three that you're choosing um, between. Okay, the last thing before you start answering the questions is you want to ask yourself, 
what is the main idea of this passage? You could think of an overall theme or a brief introduction to some topic. What is the purpose of this passage? There's bound to be at least one or two questions that relates to the main idea. Questions are easy to lose points on because the SAT writers don't want you to be able to easily find the main point of the passage. Okay, so read the passage, underline the main idea. If the main idea is not directly stated, it's usually in the first or the last passage, especially nonfiction, you have to infer the passage's main idea. So when you are faced with a question about it, refer to your notes in the passage or what you've circled or what you've jotted down in your notebook next to you if you're taking the online test. Okay, um, I am posting this in Schoology so you can look at some sample SAT questions. So you can see like this is a vocabulary, words in context, and you can see that the word intense can mean all of those things. Remember, this is a substitution. The coming decades will li likely see more intense clustering of jobs, innovation, and productivity. So is it more emotional clustering? more concentrated clustering, more brilliant clustering, more determined clustering. Clearly it is concentrated clustering. So that kind of helps you do that there. Remember when you are faced with a graph, you are doing true false. So you're taking a look to see if it is true or false within there. Um, and if you're like taking a look at that once again, you're going back looking at the graph and seeing what that is all about. Okay, I will put those up for you so that you can kind of take a look at them and kind of give some ideas about that. Okay, that is just a very quick review of the reading questions and some strategies that you can use. Um, the reading test number 10 that I'm asking you to take on Common, Khan Academy, the practice test number 10, I can tell you that the one, the questions that I got wrong and I think I got or wrong on the reading test. Two of them were in the science passage, um, the first uh, first sign passage I think you got to on um, sensors. Ugh, that was a rough one. So pay attention to that one. Um, like I said, remember you can skip passages and come to them last because you can always go back at the end. There's down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, it'll say skip passage. You can always skip it and come back to it later. So if it's one that you think is going to be rough for you, um, skip it and do it at the end when you're running out of time, as opposed to losing points on a passage that is actually pretty easy to understand. When you do paired passages, very frequently the paired passages will express contrary views to each other. So the first passage will be like supporting an idea. The second passage will be against that idea. So that look out for that when you get to those paired passages because usually one disagrees with the other. Okay, good luck on the SAT reading. Um, I hope that you enjoy um, taking that test as much as humanly possible as you can enjoy taking the SAT test. I really appreciate you doing this. And remember, it's not about your score because you're going to get the same grade either way. Um, just having taken it, you're going to get credit for doing it. All right. Thank you. And I'll talk to you more um, about writing coming up.